Our speaker today is coming to us from, from England. So, uh, um, and so we wanted to make it safer for her and safer for you. So that's why we're doing this. It's five o'clock your time, Helen? Yes, it is okay. five o'clock. Um, uh, so um, Helen Fry um, has written about 25 books and, and, uh, and uh, edited over them, uh, edited books on this. Uh, she covers the social history and the espionage of World War II. And anybody who knows me for more than 10 minutes knows if you've got World War II and espionage involved, I'm, she had me at hello. Um, uh, so I want to welcome our speaker today, Helen Fry, and also let you know that with her PowerPoint, I'm going to be the master of the control. So if something goes wrong, it's not her, it's me. So, um, so when, we, um, uh, when we do her PowerPoint, it's going to be me... Uh, uh, monitoring the slides, so um, um, that that's it's coming from here. Um, also, if you're uh, if you're new to this, uh, we want to make sure that if you got a question, we'll, we'll save the questions till the end. Use the chat feature at the bottom. Type in your questions, and we'll read them at the end. So, uh, without further ado, would you welcome Helen Fry? Thank you so much, Mark, and greetings from London, and thank you for inviting me. I hope that you'll enjoy some of the stuff I'm going to share with you this afternoon, uh, lunchtime where you are. And if we can have, we can start the PowerPoint if that's okay, Mark, when you're ready. So I hope you can enjoy some of what I'm going to share with you today. There is an American angle to this, which I will come to, of course, after Pearl Harbor. At the centre of this intelligence operation, American intelligence were very much involved. And so I think it's appropriate for me to talk about that at this point in the talk. Uh, so a very secret war. I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you'll get an understanding that what happened at the secret sites that I'm going to talk about in England in the Second World War was as important as the code breaking at Bletchley Park during that war. First slide, please. Or next one, should I say. And the story starts with this chap. Thomas Joseph Kendrick, who interestingly, I'm not going to go into his whole backdrop, he was born in Cape Town, but his father was American. So there's a lot of American links to this story that I wouldn't normally talk about if I was talking about it in England. But Thomas Joseph Kendrick, he's photographed there in Vienna at the end of the 1920s, early 1930s. He was working for what today we call MI6. He is, so that's the Foreign Intelligence Agency in Britain. And I mean, it had a number of names, but we'll just call it MI6 for ease. And he's really crucial to our wartime story. So in the 1920s and 30s, I mean, he already had about 20 years experience in intelligence, but in the 20s and 30s, he's based in Vienna, in the British passport office attached to the embassy. And of course, he's not really doing any passport visa work. He is running spy networks wonderful stuff across Europe, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but just so you've got an understanding of who our main commander is for this operation. And of course, when Hitler overruns Austria in March 1938, Kendrick is overrun with a human catastrophe of unprecedented levels. And he and his staff have yet to be recognised officially for saving up to 200 Jews a day. So he has an incredible legacy. He struggles with his intelligence work, but he embarks on this amazing humanitarian rescue and we are going to start we're starting to you know make noises to have him recognized at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem but he does manage to run some of his network still and he's ultimately betrayed by a double agent and in August 1938 he is arrested by the Gestapo in Vienna and he has what's described in our foreign office files as four days of Soviet-style interrogation. So pretty nasty stuff, 
We know he endured sleep deprivation, eight hour long interrogations at a time. He was pretty shattered by the experience. But the following month, September 38, the Munich Agreement or the Munich Conference was already on the cards. And I think if it hadn't been for that, where our Prime Minister signed the appe what's effectively seen as an appeasement document to appease Adolf Hitler in Munich, we think if that wasn't on the cards, Kendrick might not have got out of Vienna alive. They may well have actually bumped him off. And of course, he was expelled. It's a very topical thing, isn't it, to expel suspected spies for allegedly spying. Well, he always disavowed that he was spying. The British government denied everything. But we now know, I and mean, he's in the official MI6 history, that he was one of MI6's most senior spy masters at that time. So he's expelled. He comes back to London and disappears from the public eye. He's been all over the newspapers as a spy, um, but he disappears from the public eye. So what happens to our man Kendrick? Well, in that summer of 1938, the British are already, specifically British intelligence, is already preparing for war. They purchased the estate of Bletchley Park, where, as I mentioned earlier, the code breaking occurred and the cracking of the German Enigma codes during the wartime and interception of all sorts of other communications. But British intelligence knew that it wasn't just that kind of stuff we needed. We also needed the human intelligence. And our man Kendrick was one of the most senior, experienced spy masters at human, at human intelligence. And we realized also that one of your most important sources of intelligence, because you need intelligence, good and reliable intelligence, for the outcome of a war, to win a war, that we needed good and reliable intelligence, but that one of our most valuable sources would be prisoners of war. And the kind of subject of prisoners of war might seem quite mundane, boring. Why would on earth would you want to study prisoners of war? Well, if we now start to unpack what Kendrick and his intelligence colleagues did and the American intelligence from end of 41 with German prisoners of war, it's just astonishing. A whole dramatic stage set will unfold as, as we're about to see. And so Kendrick's task in 38 and until war breaks out on the 3rd of September 1939, it's his task to get ready a unit that will bug the conversations of German prisoners of war. Next slide, please. And so he had to find somewhere to open his what was initially a very tiny unit, just six of them, Army, Air and Navy Intelligence, and it's here in the Tower of London. And when I discovered this, because quite often the story comes in a bit later, so snippets that you read in early books, and there isn't much, but it kind of comes in later. And I discovered that he opened his unit in the Tower of London. Now this fortress is, of course, one of our most famous tourist attractions in London, there on the banks of the River Thames. It's got a thousand year history. Not always a very good history, uh, depending on where you are actually, but a lot of our um, traitors, some queens, kings lost their heads uh, in the Tower of London, particularly in Tudor times. So it has a history. So Kendrick's role was to open this unit, as I said, to bug the conversations of German prisoners of war. And these are some of the towers here, some of the rooms that he used as part of his special compound. Next, please. But if you look, at Salt's Tower was one of the towers along there on the end of that row that was used. If you look at this, how atmospheric is this? This was used for some of the German prisoners of war. And it relied on some very clever psychology. Uh, Kendrick knew, and it was true even later in the war, that you're not necessarily gonna get up the 
intelligence, the gems, the top secret stuff from your German prisoners, certainly not in the early part of the war. We have to be far cleverer. So what he did was the prisoners had a sort of phony interrogation. Next, please. And this is one of the rooms in the Salt Tower where two or three prisoners were held at a time. And there were other rooms that they used. So they have a phony interrogation. And we know because the transcripts, the typed up transcripts of those conversations survive in our National Archives in London. The German prisoners thought that the British interrogators were stupid <laughs> and incompetent and it really irritated them. And they kind of started to you know, say to each other, well, you know, did he ask you this? No, no, they haven't asked me about that. Oh, well, if I was the interrogator, I would have asked this. And they start giving away snippets of information. But what they don't realise is that there are microphones hidden in the light fittings and the fireplaces. You imagine that great big thick stone fireplace had microphones embedded in it. And it's all very well to embed microphones in walls or wherever you want to put them. But of course, it's no good if the prisoners aren't talking about what you want them to talk about. And as the talk goes on, we'll see some of the clever ways they sort of made them relax so that they would start talking about stuff that we needed to know or even stuff that we didn't know that we needed to know. Very, very clever operation. And one of the tricks, I'll call it tricks, that was used from these days in the Tower of London was the use of stool pigeons. Now I'm not sure if that's a phrase you're familiar with, but effectively a stool pigeon is uh, one of our officers who's masking as a German prisoner. And one of the prisoners here in this room towards the end of 1939 got a little bit of sense of, ah, oh, you know, I think, you know, the dastardly thing, equivalent in German, the dastardly things he said to his mate that they're doing, do you know, they're dressing up one of their own officers and pretending to be one of us. And his mate says, no, they wouldn't do that. Well, of course we did across the war time. They were never too sure, but he was the only prisoner we found that slightly suspected something was going on. Well, we now know the identity of one of those stool pigeons it was actually Olivia Newton-John's father, Bryn Newton-John, which is amazing. He was in air intelligence. One of the things that they discovered from these bugged conversations, and you're probably thinking, well, we're, we're thinking about early, 30, you know, early part of the war, September 39. Did we have any German prisoners of war? By the end of September 1939, we had 60, 6-0, 60, German prisoners of war in the Tower of London. It's staggering um, and, you know, surprising <laughs> to discover this in the files. They were mainly U-boat crews. So the first two U-boats that were sunk, you know, the survivors were hauled in one case all the way down from Ireland, hundreds of miles down to London to the Tower for this special treatment. And on October 1939, they are overhearing here and the conversations are wired back, the, the microphones are wired back to what's called an M room, M for mic, and, and in this case it was above this room. And it was wired back and they were talking about secret weapon. Now we didn't really know these are lower rank prisoners, exactly what they were talking about. They had some fantastical hope that Hitler would get this super weapon. And of course, Hitler himself had said, hadn't he, in the Baltic speech, there will be a weapon, a retaliation weapon against which there will be no defense. It's very important that stuff were beginning to pick up already. Next, please. And they're still talking about secret weapon in the Tower of London over Christmas, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, 1939. And it's true for the whole of the wartime where prisoners go through these special sites, you have to bug their conversations from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to sleep. And sometimes that was pretty late, although there were lights out at 10, that didn't always happen. So it's a huge operation every single day of the year. Now, in the Tower of London, Kendrick could really only hold in his special part 120 prisoners and he knew that this was not going to be sufficient. 
And so whilst that's going on in the tower, he's already got his eye in October 39 to another site. And this house, Trent Park, it's um, at the end of the Piccadilly line in London North in a place called Cockfosters. So it's probably, I don't know, my distance isn't very good. It's probably about 10 miles north of London maybe a bit less, but this had belonged to the Bevan and Sassoon families and the socialites of Philip Sassoon had actually died in June 39. So the house and the estate, the 50 or so acre estate was actually uh, vacant. So this was requisitioned, it was taken over by the intelligence services and this will become Kendrick's main operation until 1942. And just to give you an idea, because the developers are in there at the moment and they have found all the original wiring, not the microphones, but the wiring from 1939 and the hurried wiring, new wiring from 1942. And those, I could never understand, you know, why the prisoners never found microphones, whether they never uncovered this operation. And now we can see that the microphones, the wiring was so deeply embedded behind skirting boards in walls that there's no way <laughs> the prisoners would have found this operation. It's quite, quite staggering. It took five months to wire this place for sound. Next, please. And here's Kendrick at one of the, his other later sites, um, our commander Kendrick there. And when he moved out to Trent Park by the end of 1939, he increased his staff to just over 500. So he started with just six of them, a tiny unit, to over 500, a third of whom were women who have some very interesting roles. And if I've got time to unpack some of that, we can talk about that. So 500 intelligence staff, as I said, same as before, army across army, intelligence, air intelligence, and naval intelligence. And now in the next couple of years, there are thousands of German prisoners of war, some Italians, but I won't talk about them today. So German prisoners of war going through Trent Park. And it's the same, same story. They have a sort of loose, phony interrogation. They go back to their room where they sh share with their cellmate and they start talking and actually bragging about what they haven't told the interrogating officers. And quite often they would put a U-boat commander uh, with a Luftwaffe pilot. Very good, because they really start talking about their war. And what we discover from the transcripts, and there are an eye-watering 75,000 transcripts of conversations from this unit alone, plus intelligence reports, right across the wartime. And we discover very quickly a sheer volume of information which the prisoners are talking about. A lot of it is technological. There's a huge amount of stuff in 41, 42 on the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, we need our historians to start looking at this more because you get a sense that this intelligence has impacted on campaigns like the Battle of the Atlantic. So if I give you one example of a piece of intelligence, because there's so much of it, lots of snippets of information, but also some big pieces which start coming out, which make an impact on the war. And it came as early as February 1940. And one of the Luftwaffe pilots has gone back to his cell and his mate says, well, you didn't ask them about ex Gerak Knichbein. And this was known as the Battle of the Beams. No, 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 they don't know anything about this. The equipment, no, no, no. Um, he, he, I thought he might have had some idea. No, no, don't know. And what they'd overheard, what the interrogators, what the M room, the secret listeners had overheard in the M room, what the interrogators had been asking about, ex Gerak Knichbein, what was this? Well, I'll give you the, the lay person's. Um, summary, I'm not a scientist, but it was, as I said, known as the Battle of the Beams. And there was a famous scientist, Professor R.V. Jones, who was involved in the interpretation of the stuff coming out of these conversations. And effectively, what the Germans were doing was sending two beams from two separate locations. One we know was from Cherbourg, another from near Liège. And where the beams crossed, that pinpoint 
there was a piece of equipment, a new piece of equipment on the German aircraft that could pinpoint exactly where that point was. And that's when the pilot knew to drop his bomb. So it made for precision bombing. You might think, well, what do you do with that piece of intelligence? Well, as a direct result of discovering this, our boffins started to slightly bend, the interceptor slightly bent the beams. And the Germans never found out, and it meant, ever so slightly, but it meant they dropped the bombs in the wrong place. So rather than hitting some of the factories, uh, they might hit the bottom of someone's garden. Um, and so without that, as it's the head of air intelligence of this section, a man named Felkin, who actually mar married an American heiress, um, Dennis Felkin, he had a report at the end of the war which said, without the discovery of ex Gerak Knichbein in the spring of 1940, we, the British, would have lost the Battle of Britain because the Battle of Britain rages from July um, 1940 onwards. We would have lost the Battle of Britain. If we'd lost the Battle of Britain, Hitler would have been able to invade. We didn't have superiority of the air. That would have been disastrous. So you start to suddenly think, my goodness, the intelligence that's already coming out of this site is actually making a difference to the outcome, even at this early stage on the war. And we have tons of examples uh, in my book that I can't talk about today about ways in which the intelligence made an impact on the ground. Next, please. And so the intelligence is, is vital, non-negotiable, we get to, during 1940 into 41, Kendrick realises that even Trent Park is not going to be large enough to process the number of prisoners that he and the intelligence services believe we will capture on the battlefields and elsewhere, obviously, in the other campaigns. And so he requisitions two more sites. And at about this time, so we have, of course, on the 7th of December 41, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And within two weeks, because the American intelligence were working out of this site, within two weeks of Pearl Harbor, American OSS, American intelligence officers start arriving in England to receive training in this the kind of techniques of what the British have honed up until now, and also to be an integral part of this operation. And the site, the first site that he's requisitioned after Trent Park here is Latimer House. And Latimer House, which is about 20 miles outside London, sort of to the west, I suppose you'd say. On the left of the photograph there, you can see the temporary accommodation for the Naval Intelligence team. This house had been requisitioned from Lord Chesham. And Lord Chesham was told, you know, at the end of the war, you'll get this back. Uh, well, he didn't. It became a very important Joint Services Training Centre and then Army Defence College. So it, it didn't um, ultimately make it back into the family. Um, they, they requisitioned it and, and bought it off him. So Latimer House then, next please. And the second property that was requisitioned in 1941 was this Wilton Park at Beaconsfield, which is about eight miles down the road from Latimer House. Both of them, as I said, about 20 miles outside London, deep in the Buckinghamshire countryside, well away from any prying eyes. And of course, if any German aircraft had flown over, it just looks like um, stately homes. This, the White House there is no longer there. It, it was demolished in the late 1960s. Next, please. So what they deconstructed, before I go back to Trent Park, the heart of the kind of clever stuff of the story, this is a photograph of Latimer House after the war. You can see the naval block on the left has gone. But the wartime buildings are still there at the top of the photograph. So if you look in the middle known as the buildings and the same was built at Wilton Park and they were known as Lucy's the, the spider and it had of course interrogation rooms an M room for the listeners administrative block the cells uh, rooms for the army psychologists because you have to analyze how best to get the intelligence from your prisoners what kind of clever techniques 
and also to construct right papers about German psychology, army, military mindset, that kind of thing. So some very interesting stuff going on. Now, our Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, authorised an unlimited budget for Kendrick to set up these two sites. And when I read that in this highly top secret memo that's now been declassified, I realised that you know, you don't give something an unlimited budget if it's a speculative venture, if it might produce results. We now know that the results coming out originally from Trent Park was so important that Kendrick had to have these two extra sites. So how much did it cost to make them ready? Not the operational costs, just to make them ready. Well, this same memo tells us that it costs £400,000 back then. So what would that be? Something like half a million dollars or just over then, roughly speaking? You're talking about £20 million, roughly in today's money, perhaps $25 million. And you begin to get a sense of just how important this operation is. And the sites, the three sites are now working, well, very, since the early days, very closely with Bletchley Park in the codes and ciphers. Because, of course, some of the prisons were talking about Enigma, were talking about codes to each other, and it was stuff we needed to know. So Latimer House, and I'm not going to go into more detail on Latimer House and Wilton Park, but just to say that these two sites were operational from 1942, from about July 42, until the end of the war in May 1945. In fact, they ran a bit longer than that, but not much longer in 45. And they were reserved for the lower rank prisoners. And 10,000 German prisoners of of war who were thought to have special information intelligence came through these sites they would stay for a few days the cells were bugged of course as we know and then when it was thought that they'd really given up everything that you know they were really going to talk about and they're repeating themselves they're talking about their families but right they moved on to regular prisoner of war camps which could be anywhere uh, in in england and some of them actually were transferred to america and some to canada so we can sort of leave them there, I think, until the end of the war, lower rank prisoners from across the German army, air force and navy uh, coming through these sites. Next, please. And just before I get to Trent Park, uh, back to that very special operation there, this is a photograph of the naval intelligence team outside Latimer House. It was taken in 1943. I'll leave you to read the book to find out. But the last surviving, if I'd given this talk a month ago, yeah, or less than a month ago, I could have said to you, and I would have said to you, there is one survivor on that photograph. So I'm going to leave you to read the book to find out who I'm referring to. But it raised a few eyebrows when I discovered uh, this. And one of the chaps standing actually at the back, ne next to, on the left of the guy with his hand in his pocket, that's Commander Cope, that's Ian Fleming. Um, we know that Ian Fleming was involved with this unit. He recruited the Naval Intelligence team and he was just a few miles up the road at this time training his 30th assault unit. And that would go and snatch and grab all sorts of stuff um, behind enemy lines and into post-war Germany. So why I like this photograph is a story behind this photograph. I interviewed the lady who's seated two from the left. And this lady, Evelyn Baron, a naval officer, I'm, I was lucky enough to go and interview her. She was the only survivor of the naval intelligence team that I was able to interview because the rest had passed away apart from that one other person. And uh, Evelyn Baron, when her niece contacted me and said she'd love to you know, speak to you, come and see her in the nursing home, I said, yeah, yeah, sure. By the way, she's 101. So I thought I'd better go the same day. Well, literally, actually, the next day. So I went the next day, had tea with her. It was wonderful. And I know already from the research that I'd conducted that the women were doing some unusual stuff. 
particularly the women in air intelligence, they were involved in sifting the intelligence coming out of the M room and deciding, categorizing it and deciding who needed to see it, which departments, which copies, they had to have an understanding of what they were reading and what would and also to pick out stuff which might have otherwise have got missed and that they hadn't had briefings on. So it was quite an unusual role for the women to be doing. And I thought, you know, even Baron, what was she doing? And I got the shock of my life. She said to me, we were the interrogators. <sighs> my goodness. And apparently, and it's true from what I've so far looked at in declassified files, they were the only known female interrogators of the Second World War. Now, I don't know if that was true for the American intelligence services. I haven't studied that, but certainly in Britain, they were the only known female interrogators. Absolutely fascinating. And again, it's about psychology. She said it absolutely freaked out the German prisoners and it, interrogation was pretty much over. It didn't really get started. They were quite worried about what was going to happen, which of course nothing was going to happen, but, but I just love it. Next, please. So we can kind of leave Latimer House and Wilton Park collecting their intelligence. But I want to go back to Trent Park. And Trent Park was reserved for these guys. These are Hitler's top commanders, his generals. And of course, at some point, we were going to start capturing, hopefully, <laughs> Hitler's uh, top commanders. And we knew that if, or we figured that if you put these guys in Nissen huts with barbed wire, they're going to behave like prisoners of war. They are going to have intelligence, which we are not going to be able to get any other way. You can't really interrogate them. Forget it. <laughs> they're not going to give you anything. So how are we going to get the intelligence out of them? Next, please. So what British intelligence did, what Kendrick masterminded, was a whole dramatic stage set in this house that the generals are about to walk into. And we have photographs in my book, actually, of some of the generals arriving. And they arrived any time from the fall of North Africa, right the way through to the end of the war, tons of them after D-Day, after June 1944. And, and all through the Normandy campaign, right the way to the invasion of Germany and to the surrender and beyond. It's an incredible operation. But we, we have photographs of some of them arriving in 1943, and they are greeted by the British commander, um, Ernst Gepp, Sir Ernst, Gep, big cheese, big British military commander. They're accorded the utmost respect. And Colonel Spencer of the US Army Air Force. The Americans very much involved in this operation at Trent Park. And what this artist has depicted is the arrival of General Von Arnhem in May 1943. So we've already got a couple of generals from the early part of the North Africa campaign, Crewell and Fontoma in the house. But now the Africa campaign has collapsed and General Von Arnhem has arrived. He's already surrendered with 350,000 men. It's a huge defeat. But for me, in studying the intelligence reports, you get the life and the colour of what goes on in this house. And his wife writes to him just a week or two after he arrives to, you know, care of prisoner of war camp, care of the Red Cross. It gets to him, he says, don't worry, dear. Nobody in Germany is blaming you for the defeat in North Africa. And you think, <laughs> whose fault is it? <laughs> the life and the colour. In the doorway there, you can see this character. And I've deliberately used the term character because this was a chap called Lord Aberfeldy. Now, I don't expect any of you to have heard of Lord Aberfeldy. Certainly nobody in, in you know, our side of the Atlantic have heard of Lord Aberfeldy because he was in fact a fake aristocrat because Kendrick reckoned that the generals needed a welfare officer to sort of befriend them. The generals thought he might even be slightly Nazi. They're not too sure or at least sympathetic to them as military commanders. Well, he was actually one of the senior intelligence officers Ian Munro. And uh, he masked as Lord Aberfeldy and got up the most amazing tricks <laughs> throughout the wartime. And, you know, when they came to decide what to name him, 
Kendrick said, well, well, let's name him after a whiskey distillery. Aberfeldy is a famous whiskey, of course, Scottish whiskey. And I just love the humour of the intelligence services. They've named a welfare officer after um, bottles of whiskey. But those generals are about to step into, as I said, a whole new dramatic stage set. And as if that stately home wasn't enough, We've got lots of anecdotal stories, but I'll just tell you a couple in the time we've got today. Lord Aberfeldy would take them on lunch trips just to soften them up good and proper. And of course, the generals, it pampered to their egos. They weren't thinking, you know, they were warned in Germany, if you're captured, the British will bug your conversations, but they're not being housed where they're expecting. You know, they're not in Nissen huts. They're being taken to simpsons on the strand it's next to the savoy effectively i think it's right next door to the savoy hotel there on the strand in central london they're seeing parts of london which has not been bombed out and they're starting to be a little bit concerned and nervous because Hermann Goering had told them the British were on their knees and about to surrender well it's not happening <laughs> you know they've got this luxurious lunch and that's fine. Every few weeks they would enjoy their lunches at Simpsons until Churchill came in one day and he was absolutely fuming. If you've read anything about Churchill, you could just imagine um, his outrage at this. And the following day, he actually calls Kendrick uh, and Felk into a meeting and we know because it's in the intelligence reports what he says and he says you know how much I've supported you he gave an unlimited budget yeah but he said you've crossed the line <laughs> as if you've crossed the line you've gone too far he says I forbid you and these are his words to pamper the generals so what happens we are starting to get the intelligence from them and I'll come to that shortly they're not going to listen to Churchill, so they relocate their lunches. Where would you take your generals? How about the Ritz Hotel? So the generals relocated their lunches to the Ritz Hotel and they thought nothing of it. Kendrick gets a memo from the Director of Naval Intelligence. Have you seen the bill for the gin for the Ritz, the Ho Ritz Hotel? This no must stop. No well, of course it didn't. Next, please. This must Oh, I've got a bit of feedback for some reason. Yeah, I think that's better, thank you. And of course, inside, you've got these beautiful rooms on the ground floor, the bedrooms on the first floor. Incidentally, the bedrooms were heavily bugged because of course, some of the generals had a sitting room next door to their bedrooms if they were senior generals. We had a couple of field marshals here as well, von Rundstedt being one of them. And of course, in the winter time, they sort of huddle around the fireplaces, they're proper coal, you know, wood coal fires. Um, there were microphones embedded by the fireplaces. Um, we know as well when this was wired further for sound that bugging devices were hidden microphones were hidden in the light fittings yes fireplaces but also the plant pots the billiards table the trees in the garden the windowsills everything that could be bugged was in this house but then of course in the basement you have this whole new secret world of the secret listeners which the Germans couldn't get down to, by the way, next. By the end of the war, I should say that in this house, we had 59 German generals and we had 40 senior German officers just below the rank of general. We have got a hundred of Hitler's top commanders in this house. And of course, at the heart of it are those secret listeners. Next, please. And in the middle of the wartime, we well, we previously used British uh, listeners or personnel that were fluent in German, but by the middle of the war, we needed fluent German speakers. And that's when Kendrick put a call out for the German Jewish refugees serving in you know, labor units of the British army. They were transferred, 103 of them, to this unit. These are two of them. Um, that was very close to actually Fritz Lustig on the right, Eric Mark on the left. 
we now have no surviving secret listeners. Eric on the left there passed away on the 7th of December uh, 2020. He was the last surviving secret listener. And they made an invaluable contribution, of course, having left families behind in Germany and Austria, for Austrian refugees also involved. Um, they left their families behind and were playing their part in the war effort because they wanted to do something for the war effort. They had to sign the Official Secrets Act and could never talk about it. And it was only in the last few years that the secrecy was lifted around this site and there were just four of them left at that point. Next, please. This photograph, uh, November 1943, Hendrik said to the generals, wouldn't it be nice for you to have a Christmas card to send home to your wives? So they had a whole series of photographs because by now in the house you have pro-Nazis and anti-Nazis, which was a, an eye-opener to me. And they are arguing like crazy <laughs> over all sorts of things, of refusing to raise, some of them refusing to raise their glass in toast to Hitler at supper and all this nonsense going on. And so the pro-Nazis wouldn't sit with the anti-Nazis. You've got this whole series of different photographs. But one of those generals wrote home to his wife, wish you were here. And why not? Because Colonel Eggersdorf, next please, when he arrived, said to Lord Aberfeldy, do you think we could have parole for pheasant shooting? And Lord Aberfeldy kept a straight face and said, well, you know, we'd have to issue you with live ammunition and you might shoot the guards. And the bizarre thing was the generals got really offended that we thought they would shoot the guards and try and escape complete madness they were so happy there but in the last five or ten minutes i've got i'm probably slightly i'm kind of on the edge of the time here um, in the next five or ten minutes i've got left i won't run over that i want to talk about one of the big pieces of intelligence that comes out of this site because you're probably wondering you know it's okay all very well and it's outrageous to give them meals at the ritz to give them a plentiful supply of whiskey etc but what was the value well, in March 1943, at Latimer House, 11th of March, actually, we start getting two paratroopers who are talking about ramps and rockets and fuel and stuff. And don't forget, we'd already been getting stuff from behind enemy lines, from agents and stuff about Hitler's B weapons. Now, the Air Force had flown over a site, Penemunda, on the North German coast, on the Baltic coast there, Penemunda, in 1942. And they'd taken a series of photographs, aerial photographs, couldn't work out what the site was. Ten days after that conversation at Latimer, the generals at Trent Park are thoroughly depressed. They've had delayed news of the fall of Stalingrad. So the Russian campaign is over. They can see that they're, they're losing that and potentially they're going to lose the war. That's it. We've lost the war. And it's General Fontoma who says, no, we haven't. We've got the secret weapon. And some of those generals say, what do you mean secret weapon? And they start talking about the V1 and the V2. Now, the direct result of that was that Winston Churchill authorised the Air Force, the RAF primarily, the Royal Air Force, to, to fly over Pennymunda again in the two or three sorties in 1943, the last of which was July 43, and they took a series of photographs and these were analysed at another secret site not far away from Latimer House, and the penny dropped. You know, this was the secret weapon development site, and the consequence of that intelligence was that Churchill authorised the bombing of Pennymunda in the middle of August 1943, bombed the hell out of it. And some reports suggest that the generals themselves were talking about afterwards how 700 German scientists were lost from this site. Unfortunately, not some of the key ones, but um, what did it mean? It rendered this site non-operational. And yes, the V1s and the V2s didn't, it didn't finally stop them, but it delayed them by nine months because the first V1 didn't land on London until about a week after D-Day. It was the 13th of June, 1944. So if you think, if Hitler 
had succeeded and he was very close i've been working on some new files he was very close to succeeding with his v weapons that summer of 1943 i think you know the war would have been over i think there's no shadow of doubt if germany had won the tech war at that point and there is a top secret report which says that this was as close to war winning intelligence as we were ever going to get next please but the german generals were very worried that you know we're knocking out even the mobile launch sites we've got new generals coming off the battlefield with new intelligence they're talking and one of those generals said don't worry we've got the v3 now this is a sort of super gun the london gun as it was known and this is one of the sites of Morminiac, which is not far from calais on the northern coast of france and what hitler had now started to authorize was these construction of stuff deep underground there was stuff like that going on in germany factories and stuff was down underground the only way we really knew about a lot of them was first from the bug conversations and then aerial reconnaissance next please we're coming to sort of my few final comments soon so this was one of the, the photographs from that uh that mission now i'm sorry if you fly over that just randomly and you're just taking photographs and you're trying to analyze would you know what that is but deep underground a hundred foot underground there's this huge complex for the v it says a v3 installation and effectively what hitler was developing this sort of super gun will be propelled from a hundred foot underground up a ramp so you'd have charges going up right up and they're all pointing at london and those secret listeners are picked up from the generals don't worry we can still win the war we are going to send 300 of these on london a month well that would have been it that would have been it and it is said in intelligence circles i understand that as late and this is shocking actually as late as february 1945 without we're well into germany without the intelligence and of course this is british intelligence and american intelligence without the intelligence this working together without the intelligence from bletchley park from trent park and its two sister sites we could have lost the tech war if germany had won the tech war even this late it, that would have been it for all the progress we'd made on the battlefields of europe next please and i'll come to my concluding comments to allow some time for questions so so this is what's at stake and it wasn't only the v weapons we were picking up one of kendrick's deputies who worked out of wilton park later wrote that if it wasn't for these three centers trent park latimer house and Wilton Park, it could have been London and not Hiroshima that was devastated by the atomic bomb because they were also picking up the atomic bomb secrets from these sites. And one of the interrogations after the war that I've been writing about now in July 45, even now the intelligence coming out immediately after the war was described as one of the most important interrogations ahead of the cold war so there's lots of incredible stuff coming out of these sites and i'll finish with two two quotes one of them from general fontoma and I, mean, I could pick any quote, but General Fontoma, he's kind of, you can imagine him maybe stood by one of those beautiful marble fireplaces, and they're beautiful carved marble fireplaces at Trent Park. And it's the ego and the self importance. He kind of says to his fellow generals, quite baffled, you know, we've got the best generals and we're losing the war. <laughs> they cannot understand it yeah you're stood too close to those microphones and i suppose the final quote has to be for our man kendrick who held all this together who you know authorized um, a lot of the stuff relating to this quote for him the head of the branch of military intelligence that um oversaw this it fell within a branch called mi9 this is very similar to mi5 and mi6 he was a guy called norman crockett he wrote to kendrick 
towards the end of the war and congratulated him on quote the best deserved OBE of the war so that was the highest not particularly high but high but you know that was as far there are many over here who believe he should have been knighted he should have had far more um, by way of recognition but Kendrick wouldn't necessarily have wanted that he always lived in the shadows he worked for a few years after the war again for MI6 before retirement but the Americans were incredibly grateful for what he had done for American intelligence and he was awarded did the Legion of Merit in 1946. So I give you that incredible legacy and hope that you've enjoyed some of the insights. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was awesome. Um, quick question. If you've got any questions, you know, use the chat feature on the bottom. Um, and a um, uh, question for you. Now, how many people actually worked in total for Kendrick? And what was a typical interrogation? Because as you said at the beginning, they were kind of like, they're kind of laughing and like, well, that was pretty easy, you know? So obviously, you know, we get into the regular soldiers and we're trying to, you know, get weasel out of the information, but then you get to the generals and you're whining and dining. How, what, how did a typical interrogation go? So your first question about the numbers, so by the time the three sites are operational, we have a thousand intelligence staff working across the sites. And it's quite a feat, actually, when you look at the sheer volume of, of papers, you know, transcripts, intelligence reports going out, it's quite a feat. So it's a huge operation. In terms, <clears throat> excuse me, of interrogation, it was believed that the befriending approach was was the best approach to gain reliable intelligence and they did manage to turn some of them to work for us one um army commander in particular so it's more of kind of conversations befriending i'll come back to the main interrogations in a moment but that was thought to be a very very important technique particularly as one chap discovered that his brother had died in stalingrad and he became he what you know turned and worked for us so the befriending approach was always thought to be uh, easy to get the most reliable intelligence. In terms of interrogation, some of them were longer, but from what I've studied of this particular unit, it was a matter of asking them questions, um, quite informal and, as far as I can see, relaxed. There, were, there was one other site where it wasn't quite the same linked to this, but I think it was the realisation that you know, it's against the Geneva Convention, and that's very clear in the British files of, of this side of the Atlantic, in the army files, that you cannot, you must not use torture, rough up your prisoners in interrogation, because it doesn't produce reliable intelligence, it's also against the Geneva Convention. And so that was a strongly um, made point. I'm not saying it didn't happen elsewhere, but <laughs> at these sites, they got very reliable intelligence from that. Um, were the you showed the picture of the women interrogators were they did they use the same tactics were they more effective less effective well that's something i'm just going to do some more research on um so come back to me uh my next book well yeah i'm hoping to have some more information because i want to probe that further um the kind of women that were recruited and their backgrounds and yeah whether their effectiveness i mean the only clue i got and, and i really don't think even baron's around i mean she'd be like 104 um i didn't want to ask the family you know it's a bit sensitive if, they, if she was still around but you know the only sense i got from her was that the interrogations were you know pretty much over if you send in a couple of female interrogators it really destabilized the german prisoners and they just kind of were, were corporate they just gave what do you want to know <laughs> but that's about all oh, that's as far as i've got but i want to probe this further yeah. how, how far did the germans get with that v3 what um i was wasn't familiar with that how 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 far into uh production did that go yeah well this they didn't actually manage to make it operational but from what I understand, if there was one practice, at least one, and I think there may have been another, but no more than a couple of practice 
um, firings. One uh, landed in Holland, which was picked up, and it survives in a museum um, over here. Uh, much, much smaller. It's about the length of an average desk. I know what is an average desk, but um, yeah, much, much more powerful, but they never really got it operational. In terms of the scientific technological side of it, I haven't looked into in detail. Partly because, you know, if you pull some of the papers, I don't understand the maths. <laughs> it's quite complicated. <laughs> yeah, we've got some questions coming in here. Did all the German generals go back to Germany after the war? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Because one of the things that would be good for you to read the book, they did start to talk about a lot about war crimes. And, you know, there was a question about whether they'd be done for war crimes trials. They weren't in the end, but they weren't repatriated for a couple of years. They were transferred to a province of Britain, uh, Wales, um, sort of about 200 just over 200 miles from London. And they started, von Rundstedt, for example, Field Marshal von Rundstedt started to complain, you know, where's our nice stately home? And they were stuck in this and that's with barbed wire in Wales. And they had to go through a process of denazification, of re-education, but they were not done for war crimes. And you'd have to read the book to find out why. It's a dilemma of intelligence and what you can and can't release. But ultimately, by 46, 47, I think the latest they were repatriated was 1948. Some of them, their homes, of course, were now behind the Iron Curtain because they were worried that they could be done for war crimes. Some of them changed their names. Some of them just went to live very quietly in Germany. They did not do what they would said they would do in Trent Park, and that was to get up a rival government in Germany. They wanted to be back in power, but of course that was never going to happen. And then of course they just sort of disappeared into German society, did not want to be done as war criminals. After the war in Europe was over, German physicists were held at Farm Hall. Can you yes. discuss their reactions to Hiroshima? Yes. So this was another unit. We don't always have time within the time we've got to discuss this, but that came under the command of Kendrick as well. So from May 1945 until December, they were held at Farm Hall and their conversations bugged. They were technically civilian prisoners. And um, I'm about, I'm actually finishing now biography of Kendrick and I'm just literally, it's the last bit of the book that I'm doing is analyzing those conversations. So I haven't, but for my, um, analyze them yet. I'm literally doing that now, but my understanding is that they didn't give away as much on the technological because they also wanted to know some of the physics behind it, the tech, you know, what they knew, how far they'd got. But also my understanding, and I want to double check this for, for my book, was that the Germans hadn't progressed as far with the atomic program as we thought they had. But again, this is stuff that I'm still working on. And you're quite right, they did bug their reactions to Hiroshima and Nagasaki with some regret actually I think in in terms of how far they developed their technology if this was the result but I want to be a totally sure and I'm working on that at the moment and speaking of bugging can you further explain the recording technology that was used I mean you said it in, in one thing it took them five months and they go like, wow yeah. we found the wires what what how exactly what wiring, what technology did they use to record? Okay, so in terms of wiring, um, that all I know, because I've seen them, that they're, they're grey wires. And everyone says, you get terribly excited about these grey wires, Helen. I say, yes, but they're not ordinary wires. They're, they're the World War II bugging wires. So they, they look like ordinary grey wires. So in terms of specifications, I don't know. In terms of the microphones, I've got a very interesting section that this, the microphones came from America, from the Radio Corporation of America. They were shipped across. They were given utmost priority. Um, as soon as it was known that they were needed they were given priority of course shipping space was at a premium but it was given utmost priority and we know I've got a list of you know what came over from the Royal Corporation of America they were the latest microphones RCA 88 um, oh gosh what's the other code 
anyway, there are 88, uh, anyway, if there's any technologies, so remember, I could look it up actually in my book, I've forgotten, 88 something pressure microphones. You can see tech is not my speciality, but um, yeah. Oh, and in terms of the recording itself, so that would be wired. So they had, um, again, RCA supplied some of the early decks and they recorded onto acetate discs, which could be wiped over and reused. I want to know. We've got a diagram of a microphone in there, which Yale <laughs> did for anyone who wants to know how to make a microphone. Um, yeah, eight, here we go, 88A pressure microphones and portable disc recorders um so whoops, they didn't record everything they just recorded as soon as a conversation was going in a certain direction they would start recording and then once it was recorded the listener would be covered by some one of the others in the team they were only men the listeners by the way uh then they would have to listen to it again play it again transcribe it by hand, the German word for word, they were not allowed to guess. Uh, someone else would listen again and think, ah, oh, that word is this. But so in some of the transcripts you get gaps because you, you absolutely could not guess. And then that has to be translated and typed up. And what survives today, and there are equivalents in American archives, there are copies in American archives, what survives today is the German and the English typed translations was Churchill legitimately angry or was that an act when he, when he found out about the, the, the whining and dining of the generals? No, from my research, that was genuinely, he did believe that they'd gone too far. Okay. Yeah, the, no acting on the part of Churchill, but it's got to go in the ne next Churchill film, hasn't it? <laughs> there. All right. Um, and, th and last but not least, I was really... Uh, uh, I'd never heard the explanation of a stool pigeon before. I was actually found, found that kind of fascinating. I, mean, did, uh, it, 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 I hope you can uh, talk to Olivia Newton-John and ask what she ever thought of her father being that. So I just, uh, um, I want to thank you very much for doing this. Um, uh, thank you for being such a good sport and uh, doing this from across the pond and um, getting our New Year's off to, um, to a rousing start. Um, the book is called The Walls Have Ears. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And Helen, great, uh, great talk, great good luck with this book, and thank you very much for doing this. Thank you, and I hope you all stay safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And like she said, stay safe.